You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Kyle Wood, host of Art Smart and Who Arted. Right now, I'm asking you to help support this show by filling out the network survey at surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. The network is conducting this listener survey to help us improve our shows and find sponsors that you might actually be interested in. As an added bonus, if you take a few minutes to fill out the survey, you'll be entered to win a $500 Amazon gift card as our way of saying thank you. So please help us out and go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art ed? <laughs> Mr. Wood art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's <laughs> ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and I am very excited today because joining me is Becky Barcy, an art teacher, artist, podcaster. Like, I mean, you're doing so many different things. I appreciate you found time to get together with me today because you've been on my list of um, <laughs> guests that I want to talk to for quite some time. Uh, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's it's really exciting to be on here and to be able to see you through Zoom, but certainly be able to chat some art today. I, I'm really excited. And I got to say also a little bit intimidated because you, you are doing so many different things. I'm going to link in the show notes to like creativegutspodcast.com. Um, but you are a middle and high school teacher. You recently won a New Hampshire Art Educator of the Year. Is that right? Was it last year? Yeah, it was for the 22-23 school year. Yeah, and if that's not enough, you're on the board for the Creative Guts podcast. Not just a podcast, though. You said you guys are also a nonprofit putting on events out in the community, trying to nurture creativity. So not just talking about art, but like doing it. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I, I kind of get poked and teased a little bit um, to, for just doing, you know, maybe spreading myself thin a little bit, but um, I don't know how not to be busy, I think is what it is. And I find that uh, I just have to be making or doing all the time. <laughs> yeah. Cause I didn't even mention the fact that you're also an artist yourself. You make your own art. And I think before we hit record, you were talking about, you've got a, a show coming up in April, right? Yeah, I have a show coming up in April and um it's it's uh I'm I'm diving into the world of botanicals. I don't do much in the way of painting. I'm much more of a um I do a lot more photography and digital art and illustration and collage. I, I'm a multimedia artist, so throw it at me, but I I decided to focus this recent series all in different forms of painting. So I'm working with oil and acrylic, um, but I'm also playing with um, alcohol inks and using okay. that as a painting media and um, really enjoying the lack of control that I have um, kind of it, it stimulates my surrealist kind of interests there. Um, but one of the things that's really fun about this show that's coming up is that my mom is also going to be exhibiting with me. And she is a real testament to somebody who grew up their entire life thinking that they weren't creative, but then took a risk and started playing with watercolors and is now creating every day, painting, experimenting with the material, pushing it in different um, in different ways, uh, integrating uh, illustration into it, working with scale, playing or playing with scale and uh so that really re relates back to this concept of um, awakening your creativity, which is really one of the tenets of the Creative Guts um, nonprofit and podcast. I love that. I, you know, when you first talked about enjoying the lack of control with the different media and stuff, I, I was so ready to make a snarky joke about how you're doing it wrong because artists are supposed to do stuff deliberately. And then <laughs> you end with this like heartwarming thing about how your mom has been brought out of her comfort zone and experimented and, and, you know, 
that's so wonderful. And I, I love that about you and um, the Creative Guts podcast and the mission of your work, you know, in a much, much smaller sense. I like to think that art is for everyone. And part of my mission is trying to bring art to everyone and make sure that everyone can understand it a little bit you know that's what I'm trying to do with my podcasts and I love that you're going from just from beyond just understanding a little bit to actually putting it into practice and that's that's awesome and now I guess we should get to our actual topic for today we're going to be talking about Marina Abramovic Marina Abramovic Abramovic thank you (laughs) Longtime listeners know I cannot pronounce a name. I'm proud of myself for getting Becky right. But um, <laughs> Marina Abramovic, uh, she was born November 30th, 1946, in Belgrade, Serbia, which at that time was part of Yugoslavia. So we're going to have a whole lot of stuff here that I cannot pronounce right <laughs> off the bat. That's why I went, went long on the intro. It's not just because I admire what you're doing, which I do, but also I've been trying to avoid having to get to, you know, Eastern European pronunciations of a whole (laughs) bunch of words, but I'll do do my best. (laughs) (laughs) So she, she talks about where she comes from. Like I said, it's formerly part of Yugoslavia. In interviews, she said she doesn't really feel Serbian. She doesn't, She feels like an ex-Yugoslavian. She says she comes from a country that no longer exists, which that's like a gut punch right off the bat in the introductions there. Yeah, it's to feel almost like you don't have a home in some ways. It's Yeah, and, you know, just hold on. It gets a little darker. So (laughs) she was raised by her grandparents until the age of six, which is you know, fine, grandparents are are wonderful to have in your lives and everything like that. Her grandmother was deeply religious. She says in those early years, she spent a lot of time following her grandmother around, attending religious ceremonies, you know, the standard sacraments, the holiday observances, all of that. At age six, her brother was born. And at that time, uh, her parents brought her back into their their house. So basically she went to live with her parents again and she enjoyed art but she didn't really study art at that time. She well, I guess she took piano lessons which is an art form, but not the visual arts. Like she liked painting but she wasn't taking painting classes. She did study French and English, so she was getting a pretty well-rounded education it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But She describes her mother as, like, controlling to an extreme that I personally would call abusive. I mean, she says in interviews that she was beaten for, quote, showing off. Yeah. Even as, like, a young adult, like, in her 20s, she had to be home at 9 p.m., and, like, when I say a young adult in her 20s, she says like at age 29, she's out, she's a professional artist doing performance pieces and having to schedule everything so that the performances could be completed and she could be home by 10 p.m. Yeah. One of the, another thing that I found um, or I heard in uh, uh, an interview with her is that her mother would never kiss her because she didn't want to spoil her. That's what she said. And so it's it's really kind of sad to have that kind of lack of emotional um, connection with, with your mother. But I think one of the other things that may have um, influenced that is both, from what I understand, both of her parents were um, very much into politics and, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I don't know the details of that, but they really weren't around very much. And so where she got her support in that nurturing was primarily from her grandmother. Yeah. She describes, um, she said her family was kind of the red bourgeoisie, you know, like in that Soviet era behind the iron curtain and everything like that they they were politically active and they were kind of getting up there but she was like i said she was raised by her grandparents for the first 6 years so that was 
quite a formative thing for her. But it sounds like, like I said, not the healthiest situation if she is getting strict curfews and and things are getting physical. And so I don't think it's going to come as a huge shock that after after she studied arts, she kind of got out of there. Um, like she studies at the Academy of Fine Arts in Belgrade, 1965. Then she goes on to grad school in Croatia. After she returns to Serbia, she spent like two years or something like that teaching. But 1976, she goes on a trip to Amsterdam. You know, she's performing because she's a performance artist. And she just decides to move there permanently. That's where she starts doing what seemed to be a long series of collaborative pieces with Ule. Not sure if I got the pronunciation right there. Yeah, I, think, I think that's pretty close. But the two of them were doing a lot of stuff that's very physically demanding. And as you talked about, her mother never kissed her. It reminded me of Breathing In, Breathing Out from mm-hmm. 1977, where she and Ule were basically kissing for 20 minutes, just breathing in, into each other's mouths until all of the oxygen was depleted and they were just left there, um, had to be sort of pulled apart, which I don't know, there's th- there's a lot to unpack there yeah. about and I think one of the other interesting details about that is that they both had um, cigarette filters in their noses to further restrict the actual air that they were getting. And so while one was um, trying to inhale and they're ver- therefore exhaling, they're really just breathing that carbon monoxide. Is that a carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide yeah. back and forth until they really almost passed out it's it's a testing the limits of (laughs) of your body uh for art yeah and and i I think it it also probably on some level has to do with a commentary on signs of affection but the need for personal space and individuality and how you know you can be smothered by affection and not that that has anything to do with you know what i was just talking about in terms of a, a overbearing parental figure or anything like that. But um, I'm not a Freudian. I got a bachelor's in coloring, so what do I know? (laughs) But I I think it does sort of set the stage for what she was doing. A lot of her work has to do with just pushing herself physically and mentally, just trying to figure out what are the limits of not just the individual human, but – people in relation to others, right? She says she wanted to experience the body and the spirit and the limits as an experience with the public. Mm -hmm. She could never do it alone is what she said. Yeah. And I think the, the, there is all of these different elements, most um, notably the element of the gaze um, and that's something maybe we can talk about with um, the artist as present and that piece in a moment. But um, the concept of duration and time, pain, danger, exhaustion, and the actual engagement and view or the audience participation was so revolutionary at that time. I think that is perfect foreshadowing. So after the break, we're going to talk about one of her performances, one that you pointed out to me. And now I've lost the title of it. The Artist is Present. The Artist is Present. I'm glad you're present because I'm losing it. (laughs) But after the break, we'll talk about that piece. Here I am back with Becky Barzi, the art teacher extraordinaire and, you know, one of the members of the board for the Creative Guts podcast and nonprofit. Today, we're looking at Marina Abramovic's Marina Abramov. I cannot say it. I used to say Abramovich, and I was That's what I keep wanting to say. And then halfway through, I know it's not. (laughs) Abramovic. There you go. And today we're looking at Marina Abramovic's The Artist is Present. 
Now, this was a performance piece where her performance was basically just sitting at a table. And that's where <laughs> that's where I, I kind of feel like I need to call for a timeout because your performance is sitting at a table. Tell me about it. Why did you choose this one? Yeah, um, I, I try to explain this to to my husband, who's a scientist, and he and I have walked around the MoMA on many occasions. And um, he sometimes he just puts up his hands and he's like, I, I don't get it. How is that art? And for the longest time, I felt the same way, um, specifically about performance art. Um, so one of the things that I think is the most powerful about this, and let me set the scene for, for our audience members here. Um, you, you walk into this large space at the MoMA and it's completely illuminated by bright lights. And there's simply just a wooden table and two wooden chairs in the center of this room, completely illuminated. And um, Marina comes and sits at one of those chairs and she does not move for the entire day. She doesn't get up. She They actually installed a small toilet in the seat should she need to relieve herself. Um, but that's not the art. The art is sitting and connecting with the viewer. And if you think about it, how often have you sat in front of a stranger and just looked them in the eyes? Don't say anything. You don't have any conversation. And you just look into each other's eyes. Have you ever done that? No, I do everything I can to avoid looking people in the eyes. Yeah, right. It feels it's, uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And, you know, there's something um, kind of uh, biological and uh, about our uh, about our survival, survival, you know, animals in nature will be subservient or they'll turn their gaze away to be able to, to, to relinquish their power or something to an alpha, right? And we often do that with humans, with one another. And so to be in a space where you have this, this intimate connection through the gaze is, is it, it's completely transformative you begin to just make a connection that's completely nonverbal that is so powerful and you you know we we talk about how the win the eyes are the windows to the soul there's so much that you can read through a person's eyes through the skin around their eyes their expression the subtle subtleties of the the way that their face moves and there's a way to connect without having to say anything. And I think that's what's one of the most powerful things about this piece. Um, but, you know, also that element of discomfort. Art is meant to be uncomfortable, especially, uh, and I think that's one of the things and why performance, you know, performing arts, uh, performance arts exist. It's, I think it's one of the reasons why modern art is the way it is right now is because Artists have been pushing the limits, right? Uh, Monet's impression sunrise pushed a limit. It made people uncomfortable because it wasn't the normal. It wasn't what was expected. And so artists through performing art, uh, through the performing, performing artists, now I can't even say it. <laughs> Performance artists. <laughs> performance artists, they're trying to do that. They're trying to stir the pot. They're trying to create a discomfort um, and change the way that we view each other, view our environments, view objects, our surroundings. Um, and it, it really completely transforms the meaning of art and what art can be. I think that's interesting, not to discount the power of this and everything, you know, um, I, I've read accounts of it, I didn't personally experience the performance, but I've read accounts of it that people would break down and just yeah. openly weep, which, mm -hmm. again, is almost a, a social taboo. Like, we yeah. don't expose our vulnerabilities in public in that way, generally speaking. But one of the things that you said multiple times there that I thought was really interesting was that art is intended to make us uncomfortable in some ways. Yeah. I, I mean, certainly not every way. And I think most most people, I think, don't want to be or feel uncomfortable with art. 
they want to see a pretty picture of the flowers, right? That's what I'm painting right now because it's been winter and all I want to do is paint flowers because they make me happy, right? Yeah. But art is about human emotion and expression of those emotions. And why can't we do it in so many different media? Why does it always have to be a painting or something, you know? So being able to do it non-verbally and through the, the gaze is so powerful. I mean, we, we've we seen throughout all of our history, the gaze, the way that sculpture, sculptors um, would direct eyes or, you know, even think about how Da Vinci um, aligned the Mona Lisa's eyes to almost be looking right at you but not quite right so yeah, there's just a little bit over your shoulder yeah She's... there's this power to that connection with the eyes and I think that is one of the big roots of this um this art piece and it's almost as if she becomes a mirror of you um it, it, this connection that is made is a, a mirror of her of yourself that's the part that I sort of start to pick up on. I think of art slightly differently. I think art does tend to push boundaries and artists are seeking to innovate because, I mean, you know, art is all about creativity and coming up with something different, which can be a little bit uncomfortable, but also exciting. Mm -hmm. And there's the full range of emotions there. But in a large way, I think of art as sort of a mirror to society or a window into another way of thinking and experiencing the world, which can be uncomfortable. It can be beautiful and it can be a whole bunch of different things. Um, this piece I, I find really just interesting in that it's, it's something that is so simple mm -hmm. and yet it is something that so many people are needing Mm. and are lacking. Yeah. Um and I I think you know this was d created in 2010. She had the artist in pre is present in MoMA. Um and I just think it how much more powerful it would be today probably to do oh the same God. thing because yeah. of because one of the things that I think we are all noticing and experiencing is how detached people have become. Um, I was not too long ago reading, a, I can't cite my source on this. I was reading something about how essentially, um, you know, people have become less and less engaged in community organizations, whether it's like, you know, your local bowling league or the 4-H club or the, you know, the Lions or whatever it might be. All of those types of organizations and social clubs, they've been kind of on a decline since the advent of television. Yeah. And there was that um, media theorist Marshall McLuhan talked about the global village and the homogenizing effect of these mass media things cre creating this common culture because we all have these cultural touchstones, you know, like if you're of a certain generation, you might, you know, quote Seinfeld. If you're of another generation, you might talk about, you know um, – Gilmore Girls or something. Gilmore Girls, Maybe yes. That's the same one. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's probably versions of the same one, but we're we're kind of in that same cohort, so we don't know what the we don't know what the kids are into, and I don't. Yeah, I mean, then and you throw in social media in there, um, we're even further detached, and it's and, uh, it's 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 sad. Well, it is. And the irony of it is we have so many things that are these common touchstones. There's this common culture. I mean, pop culture has become so much more ubiquitous. And yet, even as we have this common language to, to speak and common reference points, we're all sort of taking them in individually. You know what I'm saying? We're no longer meeting and gathering together in a public space to experience these things together. Mm -hmm. It's a different sort of thing that it's an isolated connection. Yeah, yeah. You know? And this piece, this piece breaks down that barrier. It brings people physically in a space across the table from each other 
gazing into their eyes. Because as I'm looking at you on Zoom and I'm staring into your eyes and being as creepy as I can, (laughs) you're not getting it at all. Because what I'm actually staring at are the pixels on my screen. Right, right. Yeah, this barrier that's there. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's funny you think about how Instagram, Facebook, well, it's not as much Facebook anymore, more, but Instagram, TikTok, that's all my students are, are on, right? And they're constantly publishing themselves. They want to be seen and they want other people to see them, but it's through those pixels. And, you know, God forbid you actually do any of those acts, you know, you're doing those TikTok dances or you're posting or you you pose in front of an audience or stand on stage. I think that has become so much more um, of, a, of a, a fear, that that fear of connection and, and human human experience and uh, being in person. Yeah, there's there's kind of an irony in the way that we're connected and also separated by our devices and we want to be seen but not seen as ourselves seen Mm. as the curated version version of ourselves (laughs) right Uh, which i do too i mean i'm gonna edit this and get rid of 90 percent of the ums and misstatements (laughs) that i put in because i need to create the illusion that sometimes i kind of know a thing or two Right, right right yeah You can't blame anyone for that, but there's something powerful when you break down those barriers and get the unfiltered self, the unfiltered Mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. But hats off to her. I mean, she's one of the few people who's had the persistence to keep doing this. I mean, she's been making these performance pieces and she's still making performance pieces. She is still doing this after, you know... I know you never call out a woman for her age, but she's been doing this for decades. Yeah, and yeah. most people kind of get out of the performance space, you know, in their 30s or something, just yeah. because of the fact that, like, it's physically difficult. It yeah. is strenuous to do a lot of this stuff. And unless you're Marina Abramovic, it's hard to make money at it too. It's not um, it's not something that you you just hang on a wall at home, right? It's one of those f- experiences that you have to be there for. And then there's some element of documentation that perhaps could be marketed and collected, but it's a it's a hard it's a hard media. <laughs> so I was in grad school in Boston, and I was at the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts, down there, and with some friends and I had taken my friend's daughter and picked her up and put her on my shoulders as we were leaving and walking through the grass. And I had an earring that my husband had given me and it fell out. And I knew the general location where it had fallen out. And I was devastated that I'd lost this earring. So I decided, all right, well, tomorrow I got the day off during a, this was during my MFA time. Um, I've got time to just spend in my studio, or I could spend some time trying to find this earring because it was so meaningful. And so because I'm in grad school, I'm trying to explore my artsy self and push myself out of my comfort zone. I decided if I'm going to spend a good chunk of time trying to find this earring in front of the MFA, well, let's make a performance piece out of it. (laughs) So I actually made myself a little gallery card and put it on a stick in the grass. And it said like, Becky Barsi, 2015, looking for lost pearl. (laughs) And I literally spent four or five hours just crawling around on the dirt looking for this earring. And people were coming up to me and asking me questions, asking if they could take my photo. Yeah. And as as you were telling that story, I just had flashbacks to my own days in school when like I, I would be invited over to a friend's place and it'd be like, it, are are we hanging out or is this a performance piece? Like, <laughs> why are we why are we having a picnic on the subway platform? Like, what's right, what's right. happening here? <laughs> am, am I a, am, is someone documenting this? Like, yeah. what's going on? But that's the fun of art school. And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre. Louvre. Is this something to look at? The lab. the lab. Is this something to learn from? 
or the loot. British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's the a loot joke in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I'm definitely going to say this is for the lab. Um, I think that this is a good one for for people to take a little bit more time to really dive into and investigate rather than just spend 30 seconds walking by and ignoring. Yeah, I, I would agree there's something to be learned from this, although I... I struggle with this because I think um, of her performance pieces, this is the one that I would say I I actually like the most mm-hmm. because of just the positivity of the human connection and mm-hmm. the impact of that. Mm-hmm. I think there's really something to be said for that. I am a big believer in, in some ways, art as activism and art for – a higher purpose, even if that higher purpose is just sparking joy with the delight of seeing sunrise on the water and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, I think, I think this one though, I like a lot of performance pieces, I, I would say it's one for the loo because it's something that is meant to be. And I don't mean that because I think performance art is, um, you know, garbage to be flushed away. I I mean that because I think part of the point of it is that it is an experience in a Mm -hmm. moment that does not last, that cannot be packaged and sold. You know, you talked before about how it's hard to make a living as a performance artist, right? And, um, you know, Marina Abramovic, did I get it? You got it. I got it. Finally, <laughs> finally, in the summation for the episode, she was she actually in an interview, she talked about how largely that's the point for her, mm. that she she likes that it is something that can't be packaged and sold, but needs to be experienced in the moment with the people. And that's where it has its true impact. And that's where it I mean, that's that's the point of this piece is it's not you're looking into the eyes of Mona Lisa, which is just paint on a panel. You're looking into another human beings and making that connection in the mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's it's something to have around for that moment and then let it go and yeah, just yeah. be all right with the fact that it it's ephemeral. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that that uh, summation of that, too. That's good. <laughs> and I just like that I got a name right. So <laughs> I'm going to try to get another name right and say once again, thank you very much, Becky Barcy. I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and an honor and uh, to meet you virtually. <laughs> <laughs> This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.